Hello, dear friends. This is Anna Niemzer and my program Total Recall, a joint collaboration of TV Rain and the Russian Independent Media Archive. I'd like to tell you a story. There was this one person who despised Putin and yet decided to return to Russia from abroad. Everyone, everyone told him not to, fully expecting that he would listen to them and become a political exile. However, realizing that he would be imprisoned, he returns to Russia anyway. He was detained at the airport and later imprisoned. No, this was not the story of Alexei Navalny's return to Russia after being poisoned and having undergone treatment in Germany. I'm talking about Mikhail Khodorkovsky, currently one of the biggest anti-Putin politicians. It happened 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, in October of 2003. But unlike Navalny, he wasn't charged with a fabricated case immediately upon a turning from abroad. It happened three months later, but also at an airport during Khodorkovsky trip within Russia. So what exactly happened there? Mikhail Khodorkovsky was the CEO of the huge oil and gas production company Yukos. By 2003, he had become the wealthiest person in all of Eastern and Central Europe. Now I've earned way more than I would ever need. Therefore, at a certain point, earning is no longer a goal. It became more of a means for problem solving. In fact, I've already earned enough for that too. By this time, Yukos had become the country's leading oil producer. Yukos was a transparent organization and it was imminently going international. In 2003, oil prices were on the raise. The dollar was worth about 30 rubles, and young President Putin was making statements that would give today's Putin a stroke. I am deeply convinced that we cannot expect any kind of development and the country will have no future if we were to suppress civil liberties and the media. You know, what I'll tell you is that constantly pointing to foreign countries as the source of all our misfortunes is wrong. It's wrong in its essence. All our problems are our own doing. And against this liberal backdrop, in February 2003, Russia's top entrepreneurs met with Putin in the Kremlin. Khodorkovsky was there and talked about the business community being concerned about the growth of corruption. And Putin suddenly addresses him personally and extremely harshly. And what about your company? It had problems with paying taxes, but we have to give credit to the management of UCOS. They negotiated with the tax service, accepted all the demands and solved all the problems. Solved all the problems with the state, but these problems didn't appear out of nowhere now, did they? The problems Putin mentioned were nothing compared to what UCOS was subjected to right after this meeting. Offices are searched and inspected. In the summer of 2003, Alexei Pichugin, then head of the company's security service, was arrested. Then Platon Lebedev, Mikhail Khodorkovsky's colleague and friend, was taken right out of a hospital bed. Khodorkovsky himself was summoned for interrogation. Is this war? Uh, I don't think we should go as far as to call it that. No matter what we call it, Khodorkovsky gets imprisoned. Before that, he managed to fly to America, and coming back, he already knows that he's going to jail. Unlike with Alexei Navalny, the authorities didn't arrest Khodorkovsky upon arrival in Russia. He was allowed two months of freedom until he was detained at the Novosibirsk airport. He spent 10 years in jail. What happened during this period of time? Many defendants appeared in the Yukos case. Some got in prison, some fled the country to avoid persecution. This is when we came to know that Putin's government took hostages. When in 2014, Alexei Navalny's brother Alek was arrested and all the employees of anti-corruption foundation were persecuted, it should have come as no surprise. Vasily Alexanian, the head of Yukos legal department, was tortured in prison. 
А уже через... Arrest, was with a case of AIDS, and his health deteriorated significantly during his imprisonment. He was practically blind. He also contracted liver cancer and tuberculosis, and every time his lawyers tried to petition for him to be taken from prison to a hospital, they have been refused. The European Court of Human Rights officially requested for this to be done three times, and it was also denied. In 2011, Vasily Alexanian died. That is when we found out that Putin's government used torture. Later, lawyer Sergei Magnitsky was being methodically murdered while in prison, and now the artist Sasha Skochelyanka, who is seriously ill, is being denied a transfer to house arrest and medical treatment. Everything has been tested out. Here is what else has happened. Independent lawyers had the opportunity to thoroughly research this case and the charges brought up against the Yugos employees. I'll explain it very briefly and provide links to detailed legal analysis in the description. First of all, Yukos employees were accused of tax evasion through the use of transfer pricing, which is indeed a type of tax optimization that all companies use, permitted by the tax code. Then, in 2007, they were charged with the same transfer pricing, but now as a physical embezzlement of oil from their own company. Meanwhile, transfer prices are not prohibited by law. They have been and continue to be used by all oil and gas companies in Russia, including state-owned ones like Rosneft and Gazprom. Therefore, Khodorkovsky and Lebedev were accused of conducting business as permitted by the law and as all other oil and gas companies have been doing it. Never before have the courts of modern Russia advanced such outrageous accusations on such a large scale. Later, we will see the fabricated Kirov Les case uh, with convicted Alexei Navalny to a suspended sentence. But back in 2003, it felt like a completely different era, and the sentences were also reminiscent of the past. First, nine years, appealed to be reduced to eight in December 2010, the next verdict, 14 years for Khodorkovsky and Lebedev, taking into account the time they already served. We didn't yet know how journalist Ivan Safronov would be sentenced for 22 years on fabricated charges of treason. And then in 2011, an extraordinary event took place that went completely unnoticed by almost everyone except journalists. The entire judicial community understands perfectly well that this was a frame job, that this was a staged process. This is Natalia Vasilieva, the secretary of the Hamovniki District Count of Moscow, the one that sentenced Khodorkovsky and Lebedev in December 2010. Two months later, she came to the two journalists from Gazeta Ru and TV Rain and said that she wanted to share how the Moscow city court forced Judge Danilkin to choose such outlandish sentences. The thing is uh, about the verdict. How do I phrase this right? Um, Danilkin started writing the verdict, and I assume what was in this verdict didn't satisfy the higher court. It wasn't read. It's just um, how do I explain this to you? When there's total control from the Moscow City Court, there's no need to read it. The MCC can just tell the judges what the verdict needs to be. The MCC can just tell the judges what the verdict needs to be. Roman Badanin asks how Danilkin reacted to negotiations with a higher court, or to be more precise, the Moscow City Court. He was nervous, frightened, and resented being told what to do. There was a moment once when I came in to discuss some issues with him, so I started asking his questions, but he was already in such a bad condition, so agitated. And he angrily told me, I can't give you answers to these questions because I don't know where I will be tomorrow and what will happen to me. Vasily recounts how the final part of the verdict where the sentences uh, were outlined, was brought in uh, from the Moscow City Court during the reading itself, how assistants corrected errors and typos in the electronic version. In a normal world, no one could even touch the verdict after it has been read. Are you aware of any aspects that could have influenced Judge Danilkin? Among the dismissed judges in retirement, basically these judges express their opinion in about the same way all of them do. All of them say, 
you are summoned to the Moscow City Court, they offer you this and that, and then you are being told to think carefully about yourself and your career. You are summoned to the Moscow City Court, they offer you this and that, and then you are being told to think carefully about yourself and your career. Natalia Vasilyeva gave this interview fully aware that she would not longer be working at the Hamovnicheski court. And indeed, she was immediately fired. Judge Viktor Danilkin, accusing his assistant of slander, remained chairman of the Hamovnicheski court for a second term, then was quietly transferred somewhere else. Nothing happened after this sensational interview. No judges resigned, no cases got reopened. But why was it the judges were under so much pressure. What was this fateful event that happened 20 years ago? Or did it happen even earlier? Let's rewind and go back to that meeting between Putin and entrepreneurs in February 2003. The scale of corruption in Russia, assessed by experts from four different organizations, is relatively consistent, around $30 billion. Khodorkovsky illustrates his thesis about corruption with an example. Just now, the state corporation Rosneft acquired a small company, Severnaya Neft, for an imaginably high amount of $600 million. Severnaya Neft, or North Oil, was a problematic company that had been sued for diluting shares by up to 10 times and breaking nature-preserving laws. But more importantly, shortly before that, Yukos was also offered to acquire Severnaneft. They offered us, Yukos, to buy it for just over $200 million. We calculated the economics and decided that the price was greatly inflated and declined the purchase, as did our other colleagues. Khodorkovsky is essentially asking the question, where do these prices come from? And if a company is worth maximum of 200 million and yet is being bought for 600 million, where does the extra 400 million go? And he's asking that on behalf of all Russian entrepreneurs. All the oil industry workers were sure that 400 million had gone to Igor Sechin, back then deputy head of the presidential administration. The business community was dumbfounded, to say the least. The answer hit him in the face in the form of whataboutism. Yeah. The ball is in your court. Independent media at the time were writing with great confidence that uh, this money was going directly to Putin's election campaign in 2004. The extent of the activities of the Petersburg clique boggles the imagination. Here, for example, are two deals. Rosneft paid $600 million for one of the deals. Other oil companies thought the price was too high. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the head of Yukos, hinted at this directly in a meeting with the president. The president's retaliation against Yukos was so harsh that it actually all but confirmed the rumors that the excess amount paid would be used for the elections. Mikhail Kasyanov, the Russian prime minister uh, at the time, was of the same opinion. I don't know if that was true or not, but this corruption scheme alone already reached a new level of audacity by standards 2003. But why was Khodorkovsky and his company being punished for asking when the entire business community was just as interested in the answer? A report by correspondent Vadim Tekmenov, who had been sent on a tour of Russia with Khodorkovsky, was broadcast on NTV the day after his arrest. During the meeting with the students of the Saratov Technical University, Khodorkovsky did not conceal the fact that young people were not only Yukos's labor force, but also voters. Perhaps someone thought this was the beginning of an election campaign. A lot of people were talking about the political ambitions that Khodorkovsky had back then, but it was all in the form of rumors and speculations from a variety of people and with a variety of tones and intentions from enthusiasm to slander. On May 26, 2003, three months after the fateful scandal, the online media outlet Utra.ru uh, published the report of the National Strategy Council written by a group of experts, including political strategist Stanislav Bilkovsky. 
In the report, playing the role of a scandalous freak, I was in charge of coming up with something spicy that would appeal to the general public. The spicy bit was the information that with Mr. Khodorkovsky's patronage, a concept of transforming Russia into a parliamentary republic was being developed. Khodorkovsky would take the post of prime minister, head of the federal government. Of course, Bielkowski wasn't the one who put Khodorkovsky behind bars, although such accusations have been made. But what a world it would be if our fates were decided by someone like Bielkowski. Rather, he simply recorded a certain state of affairs. And what stylistically looked like a denunciation was perceived as a norm in the postmodern world of Russia politics in the 2000s. In 2014, Financial Times journalist Neil Buckley interviewed Khodorkovsky after his release and published the interview as a sort of sensation. He discovered that before his arrest, Khodorkovsky had discussed a plan for Putin's departure in 2008 with other Russian politicians. The idea was to make it safe for Putin to leave office by reducing the power of any future president and increasing that of parliament. Korokovsky, who was briefly a deputy energy minister in the Yeltsin era, says the politicians he was talking to suggested that he should be interim prime minister to conduct that reform. As he tells it, he was ready to do so, if the next president wanted him. Did Putin know about this? Was this why he was arrested? But strictly speaking, it was not a sensation. Such rumors were being circulating for a while but by that time. The important thing is not how serious these plans were, but how Putin perceived these rumors. We should add uh, that Yuko supported the oppositional parties, Yabloka, Union of Right Forces, and the Communist Party of Russia. If Khodorkovsky was prevented from sponsoring political parties, they would lose their remains of uh, the independence from the uh, ruling faction. And the fact that Yugos funded human rights advocates and humanitarian civil, uh, civic initiatives. According to Sergei Kovalev, a well-known human rights activist and State Duma deputy at that time, Khodorkovsky was practically the one oligarch who understood the vital need to develop the rule of law and civil society. The version of Khodorkovsky arrest being about the elimination of a political uh, rival sounds quite convincing, but there is also a third version, a very simple and prosaic one. This is an interview on TV Rain from 2013. The interviewee is Leonid Nevzlin, Khodorkovsky colleague and friend. Here's what Putin said in 2004. The government does not and will not aim to nationalize Yukos or to take it over, Putin said. What a relief. Or is it? In December 2005, Rosneft offered Western banks to repay the defaulted loan guaranteed by Yugongs in exchange for them initiating the bankruptcy of Yukos. They agreed, and on August 1, 2006, the court declared Yukos bankrupt. The remaining assets were sold off in 2007, and the company was terminated on the 21st of November. Now, the bankruptcy of Yukos has turned out to be very profitable. No, not for the official authorities, but for those who represent much more powerful, albeit undisclosed, power groups. But let us dispense with personal pronouns and innuendos. Rosneft, the stale oil company, bought Yukos's debt to a number of Western banks for $482 million, which had previously filed a bankruptcy suit against Hodorkovsky's former company. Baikal Finance. Baikal Finance Group is bought by Rosneft for $358. The head of the board of directors of Rosneft and the powerful ally of Putin's Igor Sechin is believed to have been the one behind the Yukos case. The government is not interested in taking over Yukos, huh? Smoke and mirrors. But wait, Putin promised they wouldn't do this, right? Putin said a lot of things. Like this, for example. What do you think about the extension of the presidential term and the possibility of being elected three or more times? I am totally against it. And what was the result of that? In 2008, the presidential term was officially lengthened from four years to six. In 2012, Putin became president for the third time, claiming that the Constitution prohibits someone holding office for three consecutive terms. In 2020, he amended the Constitution to annual. 
his presidencies and which absurdly means that according to the constitution now in 2024 he will be running for his very first term. All three versions of why Putin imprisoned Khodorkovsky seem to have stood the test of time, and we don't really have to choose only one of them as the right one. They are all true in their own right. For the same reasons, fear of corruption being exposed, fear of political opponent, and using the same techniques, Putin would later persecute Alexei Navalny. And in general, the Yukos case set a precedent of how he was going to later use various methods of pressure, violence, absurd accusations, and blatant lies. It will be similar to the smallest pathological detail. And let us remember that Khodorkovsky repeatedly stated that he would appear before the investigator at his first request. This request was received, but Khodorkovsky did not show. The detainee's lawyers claimed that they did not receive any summons. Alexei Navalny also did not appear for these check-ins with the investigator. A little thing called being in a coma from being poisoned by the FSB stopped him. Navalny was also mandated to show up for some check-ins as part of his punishment for a fabricated economic crime. Set a precedent, imprison a political opponent and disguise political persecution as a persecution of an economic crime. Khodorkovsky was released from the prison in December 2013, having written a petition for pardon to Putin. At this point, his mother was already very seriously ill and Khodorkovsky asked to be amnestied so he could spend some time with her. It is important to note that Khodorkovsky didn't admit guilt in the pardon letter. This was his main condition. If he admitted guilt, it would immediately make the other defendants in the Yukos case guilty. If I were to plead guilty, virtually every person who used to work for Yukos in every country in the world would have been jeopardized. So I didn't even consider this option. If I had written a confession, my mother wouldn't have let me set foot in her house. Dear friends, thank you for watching my program Total Recall that is made possible by TV Rain and the Rima Project, the Russian independent media archive. My name is Anna Nemzer. We'll see each other soon and stay on TV Rain. <laughs>